as well. Uh, so we thought, what better way is uh, uh, what what better way than to uh, get our experts to come and talk to them to uh, on how to get back on track. Um, so that's what this uh, web summit is about. It's about fifty plus panel discussions and webinars, and about six workshops that we're doing over the next uh, seven days. Well, starting yesterday, twenty first to twenty ninth. And I'm going to be talking briefly towards the end of this webinar, me or my colleague Elsa are going to be talking about how you can invite others to attend this, uh, this summit. So do stay for that. Um, during the webinar itself, of course, I'm going to hand over to Pradyumna, who's uh, you know, a close friend and uh, a collaborator uh, who uh, you know, we've submitted quite a few uh, uh, you know, proposals to clients together and uh, for helping them with the various things that he's talking uh, about today. Uh, but uh, look out uh, for the chat. So please feel free to ask questions on the chat, interact on the chat, et cetera. Um, what we're gonna do in the chat, we're gonna be giving a few giveaways, right? So for example, um, after about 20 minutes, we're gonna give a, uh, you know, the six workshops that we're doing during the course of the webinar. We're normally charging about USD 299 for attendees, but for the participants of this uh, webinar, we're giving away three free uh, passes to attend any one of those workshops. All you need to do is fill a short form and tell us how that uh, webinar can be useful to you. Uh, sorry, that workshop will be useful to you, how you can use it in your organization. So we'll send out a short form like this, right? Um, so that you can pick any of the workshops and you can tell us why you'd be interested in attending that. Uh, the second at around 45 minutes uh, past, what we're going to do is we're going to, because there's a lot of, uh, I can see a lot of accomplished speakers uh, attending today as well. If you'd like to be a speaker in our next Connected Insights Summit, which is going to be in May, uh, then we're going to give out this form. Please complete this form uh, so that you can uh, uh, you know, express your interest in being a speaker. Um, so that's uh, on the giveaways. Uh, last thing before we close out, we're going to do like a photo. Uh, so around at the 30, 40 minute mark, uh, we're going to open. Uh, so we're going to make all of you panelists as well so that you can uh, switch on your video. You can ask questions, interact more freely during the second part of this uh, discussion. Okay, towards the end, we'll do a photo. So uh, hopefully everybody's looking good and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll look good for the photo. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, without further ado, we'll hand over to Pradyumna to take it from here. Hey, uh, thank, thanks, Varun. Uh, let me just share my screen as well. Sorry, just a second. I'm just trying to get this to work. Hold on. Until then, if you don't mind, everyone, can I ask you to on the chat, just tell us where you're joining in from, maybe a short introduction, maybe your LinkedIn profile, that will really help. Uh, until uh, it works. Vinay is joining from Dubai. I think I saw you at a couple of sessions yesterday as well, Vinay. Thanks for joining back in.
Vishwajit from Pune, uh, Jeff from Bangalore, thanks for joining in. I can see a few LinkedIn uh, URLs coming in as well. Larry from Thailand, Emmanuel from Dubai, Jitin from Delhi, runs a career counseling and study abroad firm. Uh, guys, just give me a second. I'll just uh, uh, log back in. So it's asking me to log off and log back in to share the presentation with you guys. No worries, Pradyumna. I'll try and keep people entertained till then. Maybe uh, if I can ask uh, anybody who's uh, who's all right, you know, can you please share uh, why you're, uh, uh, you know, why you're here today? What are your expectations from this session? Anyone who'd like to unmute and uh, go ahead, because you can unmute if you'd like. Hello, hi everyone. Hi Lillian. Um, I'm not gonna switch on my camera cause I have my COVID hair, <laughs> but I'm, I'm joining today because uh, we're just getting into a funding round and uh, we just wanna make sure that we, we've got everything covered or at least learn as much as we can. And yeah, the, the speaker profile seems quite um, impressive. So um, happy to be here. Thank you for arranging this, Varun, and um, thanks to the speaker. I see his screen is working now, so thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry for wasting your time, guys. Uh, I just don't know how some of these tools work sometimes. You just have to obey the master, right, which is Apple or uh, Microsoft. So, um, you know, thanks for having uh, uh, me on board. Uh, uh, Varun uh, and team and the consultant Don and the connected uh, uh, law team. Um, I think it was a great opportunity for me because, you know, specifically, uh, this is this work that I'm very, very close to, right? As an insider, there is a lot that I do with, uh, 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 you know, which in reports uh, is not really, uh, is not really touched upon. But uh, I think this is very important because there are a lot of people uh, who are looking to raise capital over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and second thing, this is a world or this is a time where capital is going to play a really, really critical uh, role, right? So as borders are becoming narrower and nar narrower, uh, you're also seeing a number of uh, uh, companies entering in, which means that you will need larger pockets to be able to capture the audience. And so uh, with that context, let me kind of start off. So the agenda for today is to give you a little bit of insight about the private equity uh, universe, as uh, I like to uh, call it now, because of the number of instruments that have come in, the number of things that people have been doing. Uh, and also to share a lot more practical insights and a lot more practical experience rather than try and harp on, uh, you know, the macroeconomic environment or the number of deals that are happening, you know, because those are not really actionable. What's important is, is this something that you need to pursue? If you need to pursue it, uh, how should you uh, go about it? And what is that knowledge set that you need to know before you kind of move in and start looking to raise capital? Right. So uh, all of this is essentially the objective that I'm assuming that you're all here for. Uh, I will try and touch upon some of the foundational subjects uh, in the beginning of it, because I think it's important to get an idea from that. And as we go move into the 30 minute mark, I will try and narrow it down to allow for more engagement between us. You know, you can ask me questions. So essentially, this is a space that I've been in for the last 11 years. Uh, I've played an insider role on very, very large transactions with some very, very good organizations. And, uh, you know, the view that I have uh, is probably something that uh, a lot of practitioners would not have. So I just thought with you guys and, and try to, you know, channel it into uh, something more actionable. So the second part of it uh, is, is very big. This part is going to have a lot more charts and graphs because I want to set the context right with you guys. 
uh, you know, as we tail in, we'll move to the insights and we'll also move into uh, a more conversational mode. You're free to ask me questions that you have. Uh, one caveat though, as we move into the second part of it is, uh, see, valuation is a very complex matter. So whenever I've had these panels in the past and I've been, and I've had, you know, several panels, uh, a large focus moves into the valuation side. So I would, you know, appreciate some kind of uh, uh, restraint, at least on questions on valuation. I'm more than happy to explain valuation to you guys, but uh, it would be great to focus on the actual part of raising uh, private equity itself. So let me kind of start off. So from a context perspective, so what, what you will see is over the last few uh, years, you've been hearing a lot about private equity, right? So private equity is a universe which encompasses you know, venture capital, it encompasses buyout, a number of terms, but essentially what private equity means is having private financing, your non-bank financing, coming in and assisting you on, on your organizational goals uh, to either help you expand further into a market or to be able to generate more assets or to even create additional streams of revenue. So there are different reasons why somebody would approach a private equity player and why private equity players would be interested in uh, uh, you know, taking up an opportunity. Um, so, but why did private equity really come up, right? So, if you look at traditionally what would happen, right? One of the key problems in the, in the entire uh, business world was you needed to have money to make money, right? So you had to, you had to be uh, asset heavy in order to be able to create more avenues to raise debt, for example, or you needed to have assets in order for you to even get working capital financing. Create in a world where uh, they are highly driven by intangibles. Now these intangibles can be in terms of your market, uh, market share itself, or there can be some intellectual property which really don't feature on a balance sheet. Right, but it allows you to be able to expand significantly or conquer a certain market and generate cash flows consistent. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, the funding at that point of time, you know, let's say pre 2000s, was primarily led by dumb money, right? Like we like to refer to it at least internally as dumb money, like somebody giving you um, just the capital. Uh, side to the conversation without really adding value to your business. Now, the risk that they accepted was very, very specific. So in working capital financing, they are having it collateralized against, you know, the working capital on your book or the assets on your book. But that's not what uh, is necessary, right? If you really need to grow fast and you really need to grow quickly, a lot of it is going to be spent to create a market itself. Right. And most of the people who were able to raise money, you know, pre-2000, were people who had wealthy friends and family, right? So the concentration of wealth kind of became focused around more brick and mortar style of businesses or among people who were already in the top 1% or who could access that top 1% in order to generate it, right? The other option is you work really hard. You spend 30 years, 40 years, 50 years trying to build a business. And it eventually gets to a certain size or a scale where you are able to attract different kinds of capital. And uh, uh, that's when you can, you know, you can extrapolate your growth. So what happened at that point of time was you had a concept called smart money, which came in, right? Like if you trace back venture capital or private equity, it goes all the way to the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, with the semiconductor industry, right? You'd had a huge amount of money that was required to spend on R&D to create a product. But R&D itself is not an asset on the balance sheet that somebody could cover, right? They could not drag you to sell R&D to somebody else in order for you to be able to uh, pay back a loan. Uh, the second thing is from a business standpoint, a lot of players started to realize that we can play a larger role with these organizations than what a typical financier would play. Because a financier would say, I will cover a certain portion of the risk only, but when it comes to what you do in your business, I'm not knowledgeable enough to get involved. So as VCs became smarter, they understood the space. They started saying, hey, we can participate with them, help them 
leap frog from where they are to where they want to be in let's say you know 20 years we can help them leap frog and do it in 5 years if we are providing them with capital and the kind of assistance that they need outside of the capital which could be either in terms of talent or it could be in terms of um network or it could be in terms of intelligent uh, strategies that they have encountered or problems that they have solved in the past so the mantra became can we build a business very very quickly because you know with the technology environment you know the whole uh, playing field has sort of leveled right you can go anywhere and you can do any business right so can we move as quickly as possible and conquer these markets for tech products and services or for any kind of you know business model that you have where capital does not become a key uh, restriction on on how your business expands so that's kind of the case with which venture capital and private equity uh, started off so private equity by itself became very large in scope because you know as there is more maturity so from venture capital you got a lot more private players coming in raising larger amounts of money and saying that no we don't want to concentrate just on the r&d side right we want to also concentrate on companies that are moving to commercialization or from commercialization we want to concentrate on companies that have reached a certain size and scale but are but can utilize the money in order to solidify their place in the market right so as the as the re, as the organizations matured as the roles of capital changed the opportunity also started growing between them so to kind of you know i've used a very simple uh, graph which is very popularly used in the venture capital space to indicate what kind of capital is accessible at what point of time right so as you look at this red line right so um, the red line is your i mean your revenue line but the first few years every organization is going to spend a lot of money on building out the core assets or the core foundations on which it is going to operate and generate surplus cash so for example let's say you're you're building the next facebook uh, you need to build out the technology behind facebook right like which means that i need to be able to develop the site itself and add in all of these features which make recommendations possible or which allow it to scale now in the early part of the business i need i still need capital because i'm not going to have 2 3 million dollars available to me which is when angels friends and family or your seed capital or your angel investors come in and uh, start hand holding you through that process because you are going to be burning with no revenue in sight right uh, many organizations that we have worked with especially in the very early stages might not even have revenue in this phase of their journey so as they move up in terms of maturity they start realizing okay you know now i i have figured out where my customers are what they want to do who they want to uh, sell to and what is the price point at which they want to sell and i have not done it yet right because to access a new market requires a significant amount of capital for me and that's when early stage vcs come in and start working with a company and then saying that okay i will help you right i will my role in the organization is not only the capital but i will actually give you the fire power the management fire power to be able to take it from a product concept to an actual product in the market so that's when your early stage venture capital kind of has its best day because they invest at a time when the risks are huge but they stick with the company till the time it matures into something that is operating not uh based on the founder vision but also based on a lot of research and lot of uh, um, you know strategies that have worked right they would have tried and tested things and they know that this is this works and this doesn't work right if it doesn't work let's stop doing it if this works then let's start doing more of it so that's your early stage investing case your late stage investing case is going to be where you have said okay you know i know what works but i still have a few things to figure out right so for example i might have started with just friend recommendations as something that will help me right um, uh, to get to a larger user base but i want to start looking at how i can add video content right and be able to engage them better so that's when your later stage financing comes in and says okay great you cracked how users are going to come in but use my money to crack how you're going to monetize on that so uh, till the time that they have spent uh 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 their time with a late stage vc they would have figured out or fine tuned their business model to a great extent 
and they would a large portion of them at least would have come into the black uh, and once they are able to forecast risks well they're able to project how the revenues are going to be for the next quarter or the next three quarters or the next two years is when they start considering an IPO because in an IPO or uh, any private equity kind of a transaction uh, the risks that they play with are fairly limited to uh, uh, there being a solid business already operating a solid stream of cash flows already operating because they want structures to enable them to extrapolate that money over a period of time right so your IPO money is invested with a view to how the company will do over the next 10 years, 15 years, because your real estate, uh, sorry, your uh, uh, retail investor is going to look at a business from its foundations all the way to where it is at now and how it's going to be or how it's going to operate for the next 10 years or next 15 years. In order for you to get that maturity, uh, you will need to spend time with these alternate forms of financing and then move to your public market and then move to uh, your late stage VCs and your IPOs and um, you know all of that comes in at that point of time. Um, very often IPO is not necessarily the eventual journey with more private equity players coming in with more specialized forms of financing. Um, there are many, many private equity players who are creating buyout funds. Right? Whenever they know that this is a business that is sustainable or we can grow it to a certain extent, or we know that at the right size, maybe a Cisco or a, a, maybe an Intel is going to want in on this organization. They say, okay, let's work with the management because everything seems to be working fine. Let's work with the management to take it to that level where we can find a potential buyer. Or your last uh, option is also to IPO and get the public markets to decide on what the pricing can be. So this is in a nutshell by the stage of the business how venture capital really works. Now, what is also kind of important to understand is while it's all great, right? So uh, as you've seen that graph move, you also see that the kind of risk that they're operating with at each, uh, each kind of financing is very different, right? So for example, so, and risk, always means reward from the venture capital or from the investing space right not only uh, uh, in private equity in general risk means reward right so uh, at every point of risk that they have covered uh, they like to ensure that they are adequately compensated for it so if you look at your friends and family around they're investing purely at at the face value that they know that you are the right person to be able to take this company to a certain level or even to build a solid business out of it. And then your angel investors or your seed investors say, okay, that's great. You know, it's good that you have a core team that's working, but I would like to invest into you because I see a future in this company becoming a very massive company, let's say a billion dollar company, right? But the IRR that they expect from, uh, uh, from an investment is also a lot, lot larger. Right? Your friends and family or your angel investors don't necessarily quantify the IRR that they want, but your venture capital who is a more trained uh, or a more professional investor or your private equity player who's a more trained or professional investor starts evaluating risks from an IRR point of view because essentially they're money managers at the end of the day. Right? So the new form of financing that's also come in now is venture debt which is against every dollar, uh, can I also access debt? Because there is a certain amount of operational risk with the business itself. And if I can raise this little bit of debt, it can help me grow to a certain level. Um, and uh, they're a lot more expensive than your traditional banking debt. And then you have your unsecured debt, then you have your secured debt, and you have your foreign currency debt, right? So uh, the IRRs or the rates of interest are, you know, keep varying between the type of uh, uh, type of risks that they are underwriting, right? So the first, you know, the uh, your earliest stage investors are going to be investing into you. So you know, essentially, you could also say, "Hey, listen, I changed my mind. I don't think this business is going to work out." But your venture capital investor is going to say, "Okay, I know you have, uh, you know, uh, you have enough to lose by not making this company work." But I understand you've built a product and I understand that this can have a future. 
and hence I want to invest into you. So each stage, they want a different risk addressed and because they want a different risk address, they also want a different uh, return expectation in terms of what, uh, in terms of venture capital, right? So uh, when do you need to approach what kind of an investor, right? So I get asked very frequently because, you know, these graphs are nice and, uh, uh, you know, um, they're good for the trained eye. Like for us, it makes a lot of sense. But uh, most of the questions that we kind of get are, is this going to be something that I need to consider or what do I need to have in order to consider approaching a private equity investor, right? So let's look, let's start, you know, I'll try and skip through the seed portions of it because I think they're fairly uh, simple and there are no complex rules to it. So, uh, you know, you could have extremely different ways uh, in which, you know, these uh, forms of financing are done. And usually from my practice point of view, I have seen deals where, is just a PowerPoint presentation, but they raise you know millions of dollars in seed capital, um, to all the way to a very seasoned uh, uh, deal that also raises seed uh, capital. So it's there are no written rules, especially because the investors invest purely because of their faith in the company or in their faith in uh, the founders. So uh, typically, at least by the time you raise your angel or seed, you must have cracked your core team. You should know exactly who's going to be working with you in the long term and what is it that you're going to be delivering as a product, right? And for that, the collateral that you need from an organization point of view is, is a simple pitch deck, explaining out what your business is, what you're doing, how much you plan to raise and why you're going to uh, raise that money. Uh, but it gets a little more complicated when you start looking at venture capital, right? At that point of time, they want to know what kind of market you're addressing and what is the price point at which you're addressing that market, right? So I need to know who exactly or who precisely my customer or my target segment is. If I know that uh, question, the money that is going to be given to me is going to help me to test, you know, for example, if I'm going to say that one out of 10 customers is going to buy a certain product or service, you know, when they land on my website or when they land, uh, when they come into my store. Uh, venture capital at a series A level says, okay, that's great. Uh, where are you going to set up these stores? So you say, okay, I'm going to set it up in let's say the metro city. So when you say metro city, you also make a lot of assumptions about the size or the spending power of people in a metro, right? So which is what venture capital series A will try and solve for you, which is give you the money to say, is, there, is that where your market is sitting? The next portion of it is your series B, right? A little, little bit more mature than your series A, but what they want to understand from you is uh, where is the long-term value of what you're doing? Because none of these guys want to invest in a business which takes a huge amount of capital to establish, but could be wiped off by the next competitor. They want to know how you're going to use your customers or your relationships or the USP of your product itself and maintain a commanding position in the market over time. So uh, when you approach these investors, they're very, very seasoned, right? They are, they are essentially guys who have an Ivy League uh, MBA or they've been founders themselves and then joined uh, you know, the venture capital uh, ecosystem. And what you need to provide them is a lot more than just an idea and a concept. You need to provide them with reasons why this business works. Right, which means you need to also provide them with things like your MIS. Right, I'm, I'm saying that my users, every dollar I spend on marketing, I'm able to add 0.7 users or every $5,000 that I spend, I make $100 uh, of revenue in the first month and it keeps increasing. So you need to give them enough justification or enough validation to say how your key metrics are going to play out over time. And at this point of time, they also start looking at correcting things that could become potential red flags in the future, right? So for example, if you have an issue from a due diligence perspective that you're not compliant with taxes, right? They need to know about it so that they can solve it with you because that could be the reason that you don't go to an IPO, right? So they start working on things that could become important three years or five years down the line, but may not be necessarily at the forefront today. And at the series 
C, D, E, I think it, I think up to F, there are cases of K, L. So, uh, I mean, the list is endless, but till the time that there are certain venture risks involved, right? What I mean by venture risks is that there are questions on whether this is a like completely stable autopilot kind of an organization. There are going to be rounds of venture capital involved. Now, the sizes of the rounds can vary significantly. Like it can go from uh, all the way from three and a half to $5 million. It can go all the way up to 200, 300, 500 million dollars, even even a billion dollars. So there have been venture capital series around which are over a billion dollars as well. Uh, but what happens with this kind of uh, capital is they want you to achieve exponential growth, right? Let's say let's say you're Robin Hood and you're raising a huge amount of capital. They want to know how you can use this capital and maybe get from let's say 10 million users to 100 million users in six months or in or in nine months, right? So uh, the money that's there is secondary, you know, the size of the round is secondary to what you can achieve because you've already established what value a single user is to you as an organization from your previous financing, right? So there the amount of work that you need to do to prepare is a lot larger. And to a large extent also, the information is, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a very participative uh, uh, conversation with an investor because they know very few transactions actually come to this stage, right? So for example, uh, if there are, let's say a hundred companies that raise angel uh, or seed round of investing, there are only about 40% that raise um, series A or series B and only about 40% of that, that raise your uh, series C or series D. So you're already talking about the 16 to 20% of them who have cracked the multiple stages and are still standing. So uh, they want to participate with the business. The returns are a lot lower. The stake that they get is a lot lower. And hence they feel that the founders know best on what needs to be done to take them to the, uh, to the next place. So their level of participation or their level of being involved reduces to uh, being smarter partners rather than you know being more involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Once they have kind of established themselves as a market leader, right? So today, if uh, if uh, Robin Hood goes out to uh, uh, to an IPO, which it's uh, it's going to over the next few months, when it goes out, everybody knows of Robin Hood already. So there is a certain amount of goodwill that's built from a public. Uh, standpoint that they will be able to command a certain valuation and whatever is there from uh, from that goodwill point of view they know that people will assign that a financial value in the public market right? which is when they will choose to do an IPO from then the opportunity cannot be geometric so uh, sorry cannot be uh, exponential it has to be more geometric like I am going to grow uh, maybe 2x in 3 years or 5x in uh, in, in 10 years. So because your investors are also thinking about it from a five to 10 year horizon and not like in the venture capital space where they're looking at, you know, when the next round is going to happen so that they can evaluate what the return is on an investment. So at this juncture, I thought, you know, it was also very important to kind of understand how VCs operate because one of the things that uh, is uh, uh, is kind of important from a deal making or deal soliciting uh, 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 standpoint is knowing how your customer works, right? Like if you think of your venture capital or your private equity financier. So I'm using PE and VC as interchangeable terms because they're essentially the same. Just the private equity is a larger bucket under which VCs uh, operate. So uh, it's very important to know how your customer makes a buying decision. So I thought just like that, it's very important to also understand how somebody who is investing capital into you operates itself, because that can be the difference between how you create and structure a deal. Because if you look at any VC, right? So these are the common six things that, that most VCs are by or live by, right? So um, the first thing is there is something called an LPGP or an OP, right? Your limited partner, your general partner and your operating partner. Now your LPs are your guys who are investors, who are HNIs, sometimes pension funds, who invest with the limited uh, 
I mean, they they trust a GP who is a general partner with making wise decisions with their money, right? And then you have an operating partner who works with the GP to ensure that a business is taking off. So your GP is the guy who is essentially like a managing, sometimes called a managing director in the fund or uh, uh, or a managing partner in the fund or a partner in the fund. So he is essentially the guy who is in charge of ensuring that the capital gets invested well and the returns on it can also be realized well. Your operating partner ensures that the businesses that they've invested in hold solid ground and your LP is the guy who says, okay, since I've made it, I just want to know things are going on well and hence I've put in the money. The second thing, every fund has a certain philosophy or a charter, right? So there are businesses that they want to invest in. There are businesses that they don't want to invest in. Uh, and more often than not, if it's not on their charter, they're not going to invest in it, right? So if you're going to talk to an invest, uh, if you're going to talk to a VC about, you know, who, for example, who do not, who does not have a healthcare focus in, in their philosophy or charter, you will see that they have not done any transactions in healthcare. Um, from the time that they were established. And the reason that they do it is because they make these uh, promises to their LPs on what they want to be investing in, just so that the LP knows, okay, I believe that this is a fund that is going to make money because they're investing in XYZ sectors. Uh, so that's going to be one of the key driving elements to a general partner. investing that money and by the third year, fourth year, fifth year, they start looking at how to convert that. They start looking at how to convert that position into actual return. So that's that's called vintage of a fund. So the vintage of a fund can be, it, uh, uh, it can be in the third year, it can be in the fifth year, it can be in the seventh year, but a vintage decides how much money is available for them to invest. So a fund raised maybe say five years back, it will not be interested in making new uh, uh, investments, at least in the foreseeable future, unless they have something new to, uh, 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 unless they have a new fund that they have raised. The fourth thing, I think this is very, very critical is hypothesis investing, right? So whenever they invest into a certain company, there are certain four or five different hypotheses based on which they can invest. And if two or three go wrong, I still should be able to hit my IRR expectation on an investment. So. Uh, that's how they kind of evaluate whether to participate in it. If it if it means that you know one hypothesis can take the company down to zero, uh, then they also start considering whether they should invest at all, right? Or sometimes they might procrastinate on that. So uh, I'll skip the syndication and co-investing part. I'll move to precedent precedentally safe. Right, so most investors are looking at precedents, whether they whether it's a valuation or whether it's in terms of them uh, uh, investing into a certain sector, they are looking for where others have also put in money and had a good transaction, right? Or where, uh, so it could be in the US, it could be in Europe, it could be in Australia, uh, but there should be a case where there was a precedent and that precedent made them think that this is a potentially good investment or a good sector to invest in. Why this is important, I mean, it's not every single time that they look at precedent, but at least the APAC focused funds tend to have a little bit of a bias towards uh, precedents. So I think we're moving somewhere into the 30, uh, 40 minute mark. So I'll just try and be a little quicker. Uh, I know I've been very, very, very fast. So I hope you guys are not uh, finding it a little dry, but let, let me try and, you know, um, uh, skip a few parts just for your uh, uh, sake. So uh, the last thing is VCs and VEs are professionals. So uh, they are doing this as a job or they are doing this as a profession. And a large part of their work uh, is not going to be on talking to founders and talking to startups about potentially investing into them. So you have to appreciate that a lot of the amount of time that they spend isn't actually working with a business and working with an organization to take it to the next level, right? So I would rather be investing into businesses that I see the journey with and working with them to ensure that I see the journey with, with them rather than continuously making new investments. 
right so uh, it's very important to know this because whenever you approach a vc it has to be extremely well cooked right we say you know a deal has to be extremely well done or constructed or cooked so uh, this is going to be something which is uh, critical as well almost about 40 to 60% of their time is actually spent in working with the startup and the founders itself so the next thing is in terms of closing deals uh, it is in their interest to ensure that capital that is promised is deployed quickly because they can start looking at returns earlier so even they don't want to prolong a certain um, uh, investment if it makes them feel like it's going to makes them feel like it's going to take a lot of time to work through this right so they might park it and say we'll approach it in the next quarter so you have to ensure that you're very well prepared internally to go uh, with it the <clears throat> the other important thing is you know in terms of focus they're very very sharp and very very focused about what they want to invest in and that's by design and uh, it allows them to make maximum utilization of their teams itself because they cannot be knowledgeable or aware about every sector in the world so if it's a sector that requires them to learn up or create a new skill or build a new uh, knowledge base they would rather say this is not this is not the right fit for us and uh, pardon themselves on the from the investment so yeah so i think this is the last bit that i'm going to cover i think the rest of it i think we can we can just have a uh, uh, we can just move to a more uh, interactive session. So uh, one of the key things that most people ask me, so I just try to look at you know a few questions that typically come to us and that I like to um, uh, answer for founders. Uh, one of the things is they always want a majority, right? Uh, which is not true, right? They want control, right? I'm not saying that they don't want control. So what that control means is sometimes it will be 26% of the business, right? The control doesn't necessarily mean that they want to run the business uh, on your behalf, right? Or, or have you thrown out. Now, their job is not running a business. Their job is to ensure that they give you enough assets to be able to run the business well, right? So some investors do like majority, but that's because they can add a lot more value than you can add at that point of time. So uh, that's one of the key misconceptions on average between 22 to 25 percent at least in the series rounds is the command for each investor because they want to ensure that you know they have a slight amount of influence at least in the way the business is being uh, run um, the second thing is most uh, most of them also hear about stories where they feel that um, you know vcs taking control of companies or throwing out founders those are very, very rare instances. If you see most of most of the deals, that's not what happens, right? They they are a very good ally to a startup, but there are certain situations where they might feel that a founder is is probably staking their uh, investment, right? So you know, if I do not well uh, uh, manage my own organization, I'm actually risking a company uh, losing out a few hundred millions of dollars. Uh, of money that they have raised from someone else with a lot of trust, right? So they don't want to be in that position where they did not take action, though they knew it was supposed to be taken. So that's uh, another important thing. If things go sour, most of the times in, in private equity or venture capital transactions, they will do everything that is possible to ensure that the business is still continuing, right? Or you are able to sustain. But obviously, you know, they're not going to uh, it's not it's not going to be like like that where they will say hey I'm going to come and repossess your house or repossess your uh, or your car right but uh, the reason that they take in larger share is also because of the risk that they assume uh, and that risk gets contained to the business itself and not to you guys but once you have failed in running a startup the next time you go out and seek capital again they will want more uh, justification as to why you believe this concept will work and not not the other one but with banks you know for five years they will not lend to you again right so i think they're far safer that way so um in a nutshell i think this is kind of what what has happened uh, in terms of what happened over the last few years so i'll just skip this part uh, so in terms of what happened over the last last let's say last uh, 2020 right 
So a lot of organizations that uh, were seeking capital, uh, for some reason uh, or the other, had to either uh, cut back on some of it because the transaction space itself was slowing down. And the reason it was slowing down is in order for me to make an investment, I need to spend a lot of time with the founder. I need to evaluate a number of things. I need to do a due diligence on the organization. And that's not possible to do remotely. Almost about 40% of them, because of the fact that they could not run uh, due diligence effectively, actually waited on the decision to invest. But there are certain segments of the market that did extremely well. Like, for example, edtech as a sector or e-com as a sector, for whom this entire uh, uh, COVID situation was a boon because a lot of people started buying more online. They started spending a lot more time at home. And that led to a larger number of users coming in. And that meant that the opportunity had suddenly uh, blown past what they had originally forecasted or projected. So, uh, but over 2021, a lot of this demand is still existing, right? So we call it in the venture capital space as, or in the private equity space as a dry powder, right? Which is essentially money that you have raised, but not put to use. There's a huge amount of dry powder, especially in Asia Pacific, of money that has not been put to use. And they are going to be in a little bit of a hurry to deploy that capital in 2021. So that's going to be a good thing. But the other worrying thing also that kind of happened over the last year is the amount of new ventures that they were investing in reduced significantly because they were not able to do these diligences very well, right? So uh, this year, uh, the resurgence is bound to happen from a macroeconomic point of view because as companies move into a recovery stage, I think it's uh, it's only natural that, uh, that you see a lot more transactions happening. But... Uh, you have to be really, really prepared because a number of companies that did not, uh, uh, could not have raised capital, let's say five years back or let's say three years back, suddenly are trying to command a lion's share just because their model is great for a completely remote world. So I guess in a, you know, uh, to wrap it all up, I think venture capital, you know, it's, you have to think about private equity as kind of gas, right? So if you have an engine, the more gas you put in, the, f the further the car is going to go. But if you think of it as uh, as something, if you think of it as the what you need to build the engine itself, you become far more restricted into what, uh, what kind of capital becomes accessible to you. So an investor wants you to have already prepared the engine. If not the engine for a car, right? have it for a moped, right? but have the engine nonetheless. Like show them what your engine can do. And that's, that's what they really want you to give back from uh, uh, at least from a pitch point of view on how that engine is geared to take charge of this opportunity. So um, I think, yeah, that, that, you know, we can now, I think, move into more interactive uh, sessions. Sorry, I took, I, I really had to breeze past some of these things, but I'm hoping you guys still got the beat. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Munna. Um, she asked, how to do determine the percent of equity to offer an investor for investment? Any good preferences or books you would recommend? Yeah, sure. Um, so there is there is an open uh, uh, secret, right? So, um, and you will see this when you, when you look at all the transactions that have happened. Uh, the valuation that's kind of arrived at uh, defines the amount of percentage stake that uh, they would want from your organization. So it's not about how much you want to participate or how much you want to give. Each investor has a preference and there is a certain way in which the valuation is done and the stake becomes a natural subset of that. Right? So um, there are transactions where 10% has been diluted for $100 million at a series uh, B level, right? But that's not necessarily the truth. Uh, majority of the cases your angel rounds of investment are between 10 to 15%. Uh, your series, uh, every single one of the series uh, transactions, uh, at least the series A is about 22 to 26, 22 to 28%. Your series B onwards, it comes down a little lower. Uh, and your series D, E, F, it comes closer to 10% or 11%, right? So, uh, uh, it's purely based on what your valuation is and how much capital you need. 
rather than the other way of how much you want to dilute and hence you know the valuation being derived uh, great uh, pradyuman that, that was a really a nice uh, presentation so uh, i had two questions this is for an edtech startup uh, we are uh, doing right now one is uh, what are the parameters on which uh, we evaluate a vc apart from of course that it should be focused on that area for example in my case edtech and second was uh, that how many vcs do we approach at the same time i mean uh, is it like you go all out or what is what advice would you give here yeah jitin that that's a good question so see from from uh, just like the way uh, you know from your like the way you profile a customer right not, not everybody is the right customer just just because they have the money right so they might not have a need to invest uh, but what is important is knowing whether this is somebody that you want to work with and whether they have a demonstrable history of working with a similar business model it might not necessarily be in ad tech right like not everybody can be an expert at it but if they are very good in terms of helping like let's say you're an e learning right which is digital delivery of content they must have worked with digital delivery of content based startups and been able to take it from like let's say series a to uh, let's say private equity right if not uh, uh, you know all the way to ipo because sometimes uh, that space itself is not that old uh, so you should be able to understand uh, who that investor is who has you know shown promise to work with the company the second thing is you can always talk to founders of companies that they have invested in on the amount of participation that they have right investors are very like uh, uh, sorry founders are very happy to have a conversation with you about their experiences with that investor but completely on a no names basis but they'll tell you you know this is what this is what was good this is what was bad it's important to have that conversation and to do this bit of diligence especially if you're not having an i banker represent you uh um, the third thing is when we look at a transaction uh, especially if it is very new so for example in edtech it's something ground breaking or shattering you know earth shattering uh, in terms of technology i look at people who have taken earth shattering concepts and then worked back to people who have invested in the first round or in the second round of finance right so uh, for example let's say axel and axel or let's say axel or sequoia if i had to make a decision between them i would see how many of them have been able to work together with kleiner perkins for example at a private equity stage or uh, or goldman sachs at a private equity stage in order to take a company public so if i look back and work back i will see that there are few repeated names uh, if i feel google is is my best like google ventures is my best uh, is the right person for me to take it public then i work back and see who has google worked with in the past right because that's the relationship that they kind of share and uh, for me it will become a very important measure or gauge of whether i want to work with a particular investor or not and uh, in your second question on how many should you be working with i think it's very important to work with a finite number like 10 15 20 right the more you kind of spray uh, out into the market uh, it becomes more Uh, unintelligible as an exercise so you have to spend more time in trying to identify or profile an investor well and look at very sharp tailored messages to your investor which touches upon the kind of transactions they have done and why it's important for you to uh, uh, for you to participate with them specifically thanks thanks a lot um ladi also has asked a question he's asked this discussion seems focused on startups what is being experienced today to raise capital to acquire or roll up existing manufacturing businesses yeah so um that that's a good question so you know i i didn't want to take the startup angle but unfortunately that seems to be the more complex angle right so uh if you look at private equity itself a huge amount of money is being channeled towards uh, uh buyout uh, funds right so uh, the cost of debt is significantly low um, today as compared to any any other time in history um, which means a private equity player can access a deal one at a very low valuation two can afford a lot more leverage on the book uh, as the company moves into recovery so uh, with these two things uh, coming in the amount of money that that people have raised so 
last year was a blockbuster year in terms of capital raising while the number of funds reduced the size of each fund significantly increased and the returns on capital itself in the private equity space especially concentrated on on buyouts and lbos have significantly grown so if you look at that space as an uh, if you look at that development as an indicator there is a going to be a lot more interest especially at at an asia pacific level about is coming in to fund or finance wherever there is a particular transaction that can do extremely well with a little bit of leverage and a little bit of equity so um, uh, to answer your question i think that's a that's a great uh, it's a good question and i think it's uh, this year is going to be a very very big year especially for what you just mentioned okay we have another question from suman um what is your advice for a project based manufacturing venture where there is capex need to be funded through equity and there is critical mass of fund required to start and complete the project so sure. so uh, i do get a lot of questions on on this uh, as well right so the primary pur- purpose of any kind of private equity is to uh, participate with you on growth right so it's not going to be on an asset bank there or to develop an asset bank uh, a portion of it yes absolutely right because there is going to be for example let's say you know you need 20% margin money in order to uh, uh, because your bank is only going to finance you for the 80% now private equity is going to be interested in taking or underwriting that 20% that you need but not for the 80% that you could have accessed anyway right and banks fortunately are are extremely low return uh uh expectation investors right uh, so from accessing that kind of capital uh i think from project finance perspective at least that works beautifully well but the second you start looking at me having proof of concept that this is the model that i want to pursue it's about how much money do i need to put this you know this equipment in place right like equipment i'm talking about the software equipment right like this team or these processes or those uh, this manufacturing setup that is going to be required in order for me to get from let's say um, you know let's say a 50 million dollar kind of a size to a 500 million dollar uh, kind of a size and that's where private equity will find uh, more uh, liking because they are not going to be too concerned about uh, investing in that one single project they want to invest into you as an organization and you into a team Lillian's also asked another question. Um, she's asked: Do okay. investors fund PR agencies, or are these normally just bought off by bigger agencies? So, sure. um, so Lillian, so it, you know, there is a little bit of truth in in, uh, uh, in them not wanting to invest into services businesses, right? And the reason they don't want to invest into services businesses is uh, you cannot uh, find a use for that money, which will lead to extremely high yields in a very short span of time. Right. so they have stayed away from investing because many businesses can manage a certain level of operations really well or many founders can manage a certain level of operations really well but to move to the next level right uh, it's not all founders that can move or move to that uh, space where they can you know if they if they're managing a 10 million dollar business they're not necessarily the same people who can manage a 100 million dollar business or a billion dollar business so uh, they do shy away from investing who are found to be better bet uh, in terms of putting in uh, money are your hnis the hni is investing because this is real business and real cash flow and real money right so them putting in let's say 10 million dollars can take you from 5 million in terms of uh, revenue or 1 million in terms of revenue can take you to 10 million in terms of revenue because you can afford to hire the better talent you can afford to get accounts that your talent used to work with and you can afford to spend time on marketing or maturing yourself as an organization so if they have been in executive position in the pr world themselves they wouldn't mind putting in a little bit of money because they know how you know private enterprise works and what opportunity really exists so it's important that they understand the space as well but pvc 
unless and until you have something from uh, at least in this space unless and until you have something like pr newswire or uh, uh, which was i think acquired by berkshire uh, hathaway but unless you have something like a distribution technology or you have a pr management technology uh, they would shy away from investing at least at a venture capital level Shelter is a follow-up question. Um, what is the most important thing for investors, especially in a very competitive and crowded market? Yeah, so I think one thing that most investors are going to, uh, you know, agree on is that the team has to be extremely good, right? The concept is secondary, right? Because there are many people who can come up with concepts, and in fact, when you start off to when uh, you're reaching scale. your concept can have, can have gone through multiple iterations so uh, when investors really look at a business the most important slide for them is the team i mean from an analyst point of view or from uh, somebody at the mid level who is evaluating a transaction on whether the space is is good or not uh, um, you know the rest of it the market and you know the concept and business and all of that are, are good but from a partner level making a decision to invest what they're going to be really concerned about is whether this team can pull it off right together can can this founder or these co-founders uh, can they really make this organization work rakesh has also asked a question um he's asked are you aware of any vcs who invest into art business especially when digital art and nfts are gaining relevance right so um fortunately i want to say the answer is yes uh, there are very very selective investors especially in the us uh, who have been tracking the crypto space right like essentially blockchain based technologies uh, from quite a few years like for example there is a group called dcg like digital currency group which has been working on uh, on this space and their level of knowledge or maturity about this is extremely high so uh, they are going to start looking at businesses that are built uh which can allow for creation of nfts for example or make the process smoother for you to uh, manage an nft right because every N nft requires you to have certain rules that are put in place have certain smart contracts and not every art uh, uh you know creator not every creator uh, necessarily has the expertise to do it right so there there is going to be an opportunity for somebody to come in and say i can help you convert this or i can help help you navigate the complexity and use my implementation of nf uh, of a technology built on blockchain which allows for nft creations on an accelerated model so uh, there are there are opportunities and obviously investors are going to get very very excited or involved but purely from an art investing space there is a lot about art that is very under the cushions right like under the uh, blankets of uh, if you look at the most expensive pieces of art they're not sitting in galleries or they're not sitting in museums they're actually sitting in free ports they're sitting uh, as investment vehicles to move millions and millions of dollars between companies without paying local taxes right or for you to uh, uh, ensure that you have a huge amount of assets that you know that keep growing but you're not getting taxed as they grow but you're getting taxed maybe you know 50 years in or 100 years in uh when somebody decides to sell them and uh with nfts the difficulty is because you're anchoring out and you're you're making it so transparent uh these investors might not be necessarily invested but you have a number of other investors who understand the space very very well and are probably going to take to it like uh, fish in water right and especially the crypto millionaires uh, and which is you know which is how that neon cat uh, thing sold for like 69 million right uh, which is absurd or unheard of uh, so uh, pradyumna we we're, yeah, we're running out of time now so is it okay if we do a quick photo and uh, yeah, yeah uh, you know wrap yeah, up and okay. any other questions we can always email to you connect you with the panelists di uh, with the uh, attendees directly sure sure that that's absolutely fine Okay, so if you can stop stop sharing your screen, and if we can ask everyone to do a quick, uh, you know, quickly switch on your videos and say hello, so that we can take a quick photo, and then uh, what 
everyone, uh, you know, we've started our next webinar. So Elsa will just paste the uh, paste it on the chat. Uh, so feel free to join there. Uh, Elsa, so could we just have the quick gallery view?